Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, lecture number four, Style. We're here. This is my dining room. See, there's the piano over there. Kazoo, obviously, super necessary. Um, so, uh, in keeping with the change of venue, we're going to be talking a little bit about style today. And when we're talking about style, we're kind of thinking about is like what makes an author's voice their voice? How do we differentiate between this voice and every other one we've ever read? And, you know, voice is a tricky thing because even though you probably say, for instance, have listened to me by now talk several times over the course of these lectures, you probably have a certain sense of my cadence, of my rhythm, of my inflection, right? Uh, where, where you might be able to kind of pick me out from a crowd if you were to listen to some audio files. Um, when we're thinking about words written on the page, you know, style can be a little bit more nuanced and, and sometimes tricky to pin down. And our goal in thinking about style here uh, is really just to kind of be able to express, um, you know, here's what this author is doing or here's the way they have decided to kind of orient themselves toward their language. And here's the effect that that language, that orientation towards language has on the reader, this is the possibility. These are the possibilities that it affords them. These are the limitations. Uh, these are the sort of aesthetic qualities that it has. And if we do that, and if we can begin to develop a vocabulary for that, the idea is that then when we turn to our own writing, we'll be able to be in a bit better control of like what it is we're doing. And if we understand what we're doing, we can play with it more. We can have a bit more fun, and we can also kind of grow a little bit. That's the thinking anyway. So as we go through some of these readings here, that's going to be some of the thing some of the things we're gonna sort of talk about. So let's do that, shall we? Uh, you may have noticed if you looked through the note sheet already that what I was sort of orienting us towards with respect to style, because style is so broad, right? There's a whole range of things you could talk about when you think about style. Um, it's the kind of thing you know when you see it, but you might not have a sense of like how you wanna quantify it. One way to quantify it in our case is through syntax and sentence structure. And when we think about sentence structure, what I've done for our, for just like the ease of discussion here, is to think about basically uh, simple and complex sentences, um, paratactic sentences, which are very uh, sort of uh, subject oriented, which move very in a very linear fashion from left to right. This is Hemingway and William Carlos Williams, um, and also hypotactic sentences which tend to use a lot of subordination, which tend to move back and forth in time, which tend to add a lot of qualifiers and ifs and buts and therefores, uh, which sort of tend to kind of be a bit more spiral-like in their logic. Uh, this is Proust and uh, Auden in this case. This is kind of our way into thinking about, you know, like, oh yeah, now that you mention it, when I read these two authors, when I read these authors paired against one another, it does become apparent that like they are doing very different stuff, not just not even so much with what they're talking about or what, what's at stake, but just like the way they have chosen to speak, right? And the, the you know, the human brain is capable of like recognizing that's something uh, I wish I had it in front of me, but it's like thousands of different voices and you can recognize them pretty quick. And so when we think about a voice on the page, there are certain limitations that we're working in. You don't have the benefit of inflection. You don't have the benefit of writ of like, um, you know, just like the timbre of a voice, you don't have the benefit of all these other cues that you're, say, getting from me right now, uh, visual cues, right, a audio cues, that sort of thing. So when we think about what style asks of us on a page, we're limited in a little bit in terms of what we have to work with. So let's think about that as it presents itself. We're going to look first at the paratactic style and how it sets it up and, and how really it, it influences our perception of a given text. So let's look first at the Hemingway. And I will pull that up here. So I chose to include the first section of A Farewell to Arms. And I, it's a beautiful section. I love this section a lot. And the thing that I should point out um, in these samples is that, of course, no novel, you know, is going to be like paratactic, hypotactic through the entirety of it because you would think, you know, it would become absurd sort of at a certain point. But the idea is that in a, in a certain mode of speaking, you might be given toward a certain way of orienting your sentences. And so I want to pay particular attention to this opening paragraph. Let's take a drink here. And as you listen to this, just kind of think about the way these sounds sort of grab you. 
in the late in the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Troops went by the house and down the road, and the dust they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees, too, were dusty, and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising, and leaves stirred by the breeze, falling, and the soldiers marching, and afterward the road bare and white except for the leaves. Now, reading this, um, a, a few things should sort of become apparent. I mentioned in the notes that sometimes that a, the paratactic style almost uh, bears some resemblance to cubism in that it will tend to present uh, sort of close-ups, right, small shots of individual images beside each other. And instead of saying, hey, look, here's a very complicated picture and here's how it all goes together, here's how the puzzle, puzzle pieces fit, it's rather like, here's a close-up, here's a close-up of a house in a village. Here's a close-up of river and plains. Here's a close, okay, now here's a close-up. Zoom in on the river, pebbles and boulders. What about them? Here they are, dry and white in the sun. Close-up on the water, close-up close on the troops, and the trees, and the leaves, and the troops, and the leaves, and the troops, and the leaves. You know, you, if, if you want to think about the way a scene like this would be shot, if it were to be shot for a film, what you tend to 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 get in this experience of reading is as you move through time, you're getting distinct images of things, right? Here is a picture of the house. Here is a picture of the river. Here is a picture of the pebbles and boulders. Here is a picture of the water. Even to the point of, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels, right? Blue here almost takes on the quality of a verb, right, to be blue. Right, uh, whereas we know, of course, it's really an adjective. But the way it's just, the way it's put here, and the same thing happens here in white, except for the leaves. You have a nice symmetry in blue in the channels and white, except for the leaves here. Uh, the way you might experience something like this is again as a series of snapshots, and the effect that that has on the reader, you know, it might depend on the reader. But the point is, is like it's intentional, right? That Hemingway is being very well, first of all, he's being very Hemingway, but he's being very intentional just about the kind of picture he paints for you, right? He's trying to give you a sense of this place. He's trying to show you a bunch of things, but think about what happens. You know, if I show you a bunch of images very quickly and I ask you which one of these things does not belong, I show you, uh, I show you a house in a nice village, I show you a river, I show you pebbles and boulders, I show you a, uh, a nice country scene, oh, in the middle, here or there, there's a couple images of just some troops going by. You know, you might be sort of, if you were in some kind of study to pick out, oh, the troops don't belong here. And that's sort of the commentary that's being raised, of course, in, in the style here. But it's not like Hemingway is coming out and saying, hey, war is bad. It's more just like, hey, look the way I set these troops within this description of this place I'm looking at. Style is not without content. Style can be political. Style can be a commentary on the world. So as you read something, as you think about what paratactic style can do, which what it can do is it can it can present very, very clear, vivid, sensory descriptions of things. But at the same time, when you put those things next to each other, you open up all this potential for irony, uh, for tension, uh, for plot movement. Um, and so there's a real, you know, at least in the work of Hemingway, and this is what some kind of differentiated him and made him famous, this immediacy, this sort of... Uh, this, this voice that kind of uh, journalistically chronicles things, but in, in so doing deceptively does present an argument. Um, now, we looked at, in a similar sense, uh, William Carlos Williams, who, if I'm being honest, is probably my favorite uh, 20th century poet, certainly of the modernist poets. And while this isn't necessarily purely um, paratactic in style. Um, it is syntactically rather simple in that the relationships between objects that is able to be decoded in such a way that as you move through it, um, there are there isn't a whole lot of degree of misdirection. You can get a sense of every single uh, descriptor 
Every single verb is sort of paired with something that is very logical and very immediate to it. Um, you get this qualifier in the beginning, according to Bruegel, when Icarus fell. Those double qualifiers of according to and when, which ask you to put in suspension in sort of hypotactic moment, ask you to think about, hey, here's two things going on, according to so-and-so, when so-and-so. If you hold that in your mind, that gesture, what you get from there is actually a rather simple description of a few things that are going on, which under the umbrella of Bruegel and the legend which he's talking about, which is the death of Icarus um, after he, um, after his, he flies from his father Daedalus um, on the island of Minos here, uh, what you get are very simple images. A farmer was plowing his field. The whole pageantry of the year was awake, tingling near, the edge of the sea concerned with itself, sweating in the sun that melted the wax's wings. There's a bouncing ball rhythm kind of going off. And what's important, and I, and I mentioned this in my notes too, is what you want to think about is like, what is the effect of the style I'm choosing to speak in? Uh, what, what is the effect that that's going to have on the content that I'm using it to describe, right? If you describe something like a car accident, for instance, with this very sort of like terse, uh, unemotional, uh, matter of fact, blunt language, you know, your reader is apt to think that you have a certain uh, emotional slant on the thing you're being, you're looking at. Even if it isn't like you're saying right out, hey, here's what I feel about this, you can convey it, right, um, in the act of speaking such as you are. So here in Landscape of the Fall of Icarus, what tends to happen is like at the very end, you get this punchline. Unsignificantly off the coast, there was a splash quite unnoticed. This was Icarus drowning, right? And even in the same way that Icarus sort of is falling in the back of the painting. Uh, you have Williams sort of like putting Icarus's name in the first and in the last. Icarus's name drops from the first stanza to the last stanza. And to be reduced to this pronoun, like this was Icarus drowning, that this was, reduces Icarus from a character to a, he becomes a splash and nothing more. And so in the diction of this piece, in the syntactic structure of this piece, what we're interested in and what I'm interested in having you think about is like, when you describe something, think about how you want to describe it. And sometimes describing something that is extremely traumatic and, and symbolically freighted, like Icarus's journey, uh, can be really quite interestingly described if you use, say, a simple, straightforward style like that of Williams. All right. Now, in the case of our other readings, you can look, I mean, just look at this. When you think about hypotactic style, I mean, obviously I choose these excerpts because they are extreme uh, and readily, you know, sort of offer themselves up for, you know, as examples of one and the other. I mean, if you look at Proust's work, and this is from Remembrance of Things Past, the first, the first book, um, and it's translated, and forgive me for not, uh, you, the French is readily available too, but if you just look at it, um, the sentences are freaking long. They double back on each other. They undercut each other. They make you think one thing is going on and something else is going on. Let's take a look at one sentence from this piece. Let me just start right here. To live in, Calbray was a trifle depressing, like its streets, whose houses, built of the blackened stone of the country, fronted with outside steps, capped with gables which projected long shadows downwards, were so dark that one had, as soon as the sun began to go down, to draw the, back the curtains in the sitting room windows, streets with the solemn names of saints, not a few of whom figured in the history of the early lords of Cambrai, such as Rue Saint-Hilaire, Rue Saint-Jacques, Rue Saint-Esprit, onto which little garden gate opened. And these Cambrai streets existed, exist in so remote a quarter of my memory, painted in colors so different from those in which the world is decked for me today, that in fact one and all of them, and the church which towered above them in the square, seem to me now more unsubstantial than the projections of my magic lantern. While at times I feel that to be able to cross the Rue Saint-Hilaire again, to engage in the room of the Rue des so and the hostelry of the Offiché, from whose windows in the pavement used to rise a smell of cooking, which still which rises still in my mind now and then, and the same warm gusts of comfort would be to secure a contact with the unseen world more marvelously supernatural than it would be to make all those acquaintance and to chat with Genevieve de Bramont. Okay, you get all that? I want you to think about what becomes possible when you sort of like push to the absolute caricature-like limit of 
possibility of what a sentence can accommodate. And think about all the, all the complexity and all the idiosyncrasy that offers itself up to you when you think about, hey, I'm not writing a composition paper anymore. I am not going to get that comment in the margins run on, fix, right? If you are hip to that, certain things like this in Proust's case become available to you. So let's think about this. In Hemingway's case, we moved as the eye moves from object in general to zoom in to quality, right? Stone, the stone is white. The stone is next to water. What is the water like? What is the water next to, right? Whereas in here, we start from impressions. Now, Proust is an ex extremely... There is no more content. Sorry, smartwatch. Uh, Proust is extremely interested in memory, right? And so memory, you know, our experience of it doesn't... Pers 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 it doesn't really like proceed in a left to right fashion, right? So we get to live in, Cambrai was, imp is, was depressing. That's an emotional description. Then, boom, like it's streets, okay? Streets. What about those streets? The houses built of black and stone in front of those, blah, 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 blah. We get a description of the streets. Then we get their darkness, which goes back to this impulse, right? Depressing. We need a, a proof that the streets were depressing. So here we are, what makes them depressing? They're dark. Sun go down, draw back the curtains in the sitting room. So now we move from outside in the streets to we're actually sitting in the back in there to draw back the curtains in the sitting room windows. Now we get a description of the streets with their names of saints. We get ideas of history, right? These saints who figured in their history. We get the character's intelligence, my aunt's house. We get actually a fair bit of concrete description. Rue St. Hildegard, which ran past her railings, and the Rue St. Esprit, which the little gate opened. This is a house on the corner, right? These two streets both run by it. And then we get, actually, we're not there at all. We're actually just remembering these. And we know that we're, rem we're remembering them in such a way that this, we are doing so in contrast to the way the streets present themselves now, much in the same way that if you were to go home, you would have an experience of your home that is much different than, say, way it, the way it was when you would have been growing up there. You get a description of the church. You know, get a judgment on the part of the current narrator's position. You get a description of the narrator physically moving through this space. You get a sense of the past, what has been lost. You get a sense of a, the impression, rise the smell of cooking now and then. And then, essentially, what you get contact with the unseen world. This is a passage about memory. It's like, hey, let me draw you a picture of the house I grew up in. And what happens? You get descriptions, you get names, you get spatial qualities, you get sensory information, you get here's a time I walked there then, here's a time I walked there now. You get all of this within the span of a single sentence. Time exists in a singularity, right? They, it overlaps. The time you were there then is the same as the time you are there now. You, the reader experiences these things simultaneously. The whole book is like this. And it asks a lot of you because it basically asks, by the time you're out, you're down here, right? You should, ideally, if the writer is doing his job, remember where you started, right? And what a journey, right, between there and here. Look at all the stuff that has been asked of you to kind of juggle all these balls that Proust is, is trying to keep in the air and not without dropping. And essentially what I want you to think about with this type of style is when you complicate things, what do you accomplish, right? When you use these clauses, which ran past the railings, when you use the but and for and although clauses, Think about what is most essential for me to communicate here. For Proust, his subject is memory itself. And so it's not enough just to describe a house the way Hemingway describes a hillside. You have to describe the experience of remembering the house. And if you're going to describe the experience of remembering the house, you're going to have to ask the reader to superimpose two images onto one another, because that's the way that memory works, at least in Proust's mind. So I won't go into the odd now because we're getting a bit long. Um, in the lecture, but suffice it to say, 
that one aspect of style is the way you group your sentences together. And as you think about these readings, as you work your way through them, be thinking about what one style accomplishes and accommodates and what it restricts and what it does not provide for. And in your own writing, as you look through it, think about like, okay, well, what kind of sentences are these anyway? What sort of mode am I speaking in? And when you do so, recognize that the mixture of these two styles is what opens up certain possibilities for us. You are not bound to either of them, but each accomplishes its own goal. All right, that's it for now. We'll be back with more next time.